My name is Rod Hart. I'm a manager for health promotion and wellness at ODS Health. We're a Portland-based health plan uh, providing both dental and medical um, benefits and administration. Um, we've been doing that since 1955. And in my role there, it really focuses on two things. I wear two hats, population analytics, so really understanding the burden of disease for the commercial population that we administer um, benefits for. But on the other side of that is really playing more of a clinical role in terms of delivering condition and individually um, um, individualized programs and services to members that are based on their traits. Last night in John's presentation, three words really struck me. They were align, inspire, and connect. Align, inspire, and connect. And I think if you really consider the work that we do in terms of health innovation, it's really about being able to inspire people, to instill trust that they want to move forward with you or with the organization that you may represent or the program or service that you're offering. And I think one of the other aspects of what John talked about was this whole thing about not thinking about, but getting people to act on being healthy. Because people can think themselves in circles, but for them to actually start to take steps is where I think we start to have some, some uh, real traction. I consider myself a health activationist. Um, and that actually comes from my own experience. Um, I grew up with a demographic of being an obese childhood lifestyle. In terms of my adolescence and my early adulthood, I was still overweight and obese, uh, topping out at about 210 pounds. So in this little frame, it didn't work really well. Um, so in terms of my clinical practice as a registered nurse, working primarily in the areas of mental health and behavioral um, change with individuals and also working in the occupational setting, it's sort of been my passion to help instill that. The problem we have is that when we take the typical clinical approach, it's much like this. It's very directive. We really don't help Joe except from the sidelines, telling Joe where he needs to go and how fast he should do it. Or it can look a little bit like this in terms of just really pointing the way and just saying sayonara, I hope you make it, but not giving the person or understanding truly where they're coming from, that's the essence of being able to connect and still trust with an individual, is ensuring that you're not there on the sidelines, but actually out on the ground with them, helping them move forward. You've all seen the healthcare continuum. I'm all sure you're very familiar with it, um, but in my work every day, I'm constantly looking at this and thinking about it because in my role, what I'm doing is literally working at people along this entire spectrum. So as we move up that spectrum from people that are essentially healthy to those that are really sick, my job is trying to push them back to the right um, for you guys in terms of seeing that they have the ability to find an optimal level of health for themselves. But again, how do you get them there? That's the piece. We all know that 80%, the 80-20 rule, we got this large population of healthy people that are plugging along pretty good for the most part. And then we have this 15% of the population that are high utilizers. So what do we do with that 80%? We're all struggling with that. How do we get them to start to think about what lies in their future? Um, their own insurance policy, in essence, is their own lifestyle, their own habits, and getting them to see that and play a role in it. Because the reality is, at any point in time, what is this year's low burden of risk is going to be next year's moderate to high burden of risk. These people are just going to move in that direction. Everything is pushing against us in terms of the work that we do. We've talked about it earlier uh, in terms of marketing. Everything that's out there in terms of the environment is not really helping people be healthy. So we have to figure out ways using gamification and other aspects of what we've talked about to help get there. Uh, and that's what excites me about this conference because I really feel like there's this convergence of various specialties and interests that really want to do something. And it's just exciting to be part of that gig. The way that I also think of this, and we actually use patient activations as one of the tools um, in our arsenal in terms of working with members with long-term chronic disease. When you think of patient activation measures, you can think of that continuum. And we talked about it yesterday as we were talking about gamification, is that people are at various levels. And in my own experience, if I apply it here, I was a level one. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know who to interact with. My parents weren't sure what to do with me. This is the 1960s, folks. Mars candy bars, snowballs, and hostess. 
okay? And I liked it. Um, so they're like, what do we do? This kid is just you know, consumed with sugar, essentially. So I, I wasn't sure what to do either. But in the process of that, you also think about people in terms of their personas, their style. So we, what we need to do is truly understand people at a much more granular level. And really, who are they? You know, what is their behavioral set that makes up who they are and what they do? And really understand that from the aspect of confidence, their knowledge and skill set, and their true ability to see themselves playing a role in their healthcare. Because in level one, people don't have that awareness. They don't even see that they have a role. So everything is being directed at them, but they don't know what to do with it. As you move up that spectrum, people start to build skill sets. They start to develop some level of confidence, especially as they start to approach level three, because they're starting to take baby steps where they're having some small successes, but they need support, guidance, and really uh, affirmation to keep them moving forward. And then at level four, those are the success stories. We have one with us, Barbara, here today, myself, who are people who have mastered their disease and their condition. They've overcome it, they put it behind them. It's not something that's in front of them. And they understand the tools, the resources that they need at hand to really be successful, not only for themselves, but these are people that become mentors. They become navigators for other individuals. And that's where the power of what we're doing starts to have some significant impact. When we think of patient engagement and activation, again, going back to those three domains that I'll remind you of, knowledge, skills, confidence. Of the three, the confidence is the most important part because people are stuck without that level of confidence in yourself and in your abilities and the people that are caring for you, you're gonna be reluctant to wanna to take steps, even for yourself, that are gonna be helpful. When you think of it from what we do as a payer, you know, all of my focus is a lot in terms of treatment compliance, medication adherence, and getting people to um, think about how they interface with the healthcare system and the frequency with which they do. But more of it goes back to peeling back the onion and really understanding that individual's skills. And I'll talk about that in terms of what we do in disease management and health coaching. If you think of it in terms of examples of transition with regards to acute care situations and episodes, you can look at it in the outpatient setting with long-term chronic disease, as Paul discussed earlier. This is a key opportunity to be able to deliver very customized, specific interventions to individuals based on their behaviors, their skill sets, and their knowledge sets. Because unless you do that, if you just do a vanilla approach and treat every diabetic as a diabetic, you're gonna lose the war. You're never gonna get there if you never approach the individual about who they are and try to understand them from that context and then start to develop and wrap your disease management and your services around that. Also from the standpoint, if you look at it from the inpatient setting and you're discharging somebody from the hospital, do you really understand those domains in terms of where they are, in terms of their knowledge, their skill sets, and their abilities before you push the button and they walk out the door? I don't think it always happens. I've seen it over and over again where we'll contact an individual a month later, and I see it primarily in, in behavioral health, where the individual did not understand the instructions with regards to their medications, they did not understand who they should see or follow up with, and by gosh, you know what? I've got a readmission that I've got a case manager working on. And urgent care, another example. People are fragmented. They don't know who they're seeing. Frequently, you'll have people seeing three, four, or five providers. So they're not sure of the direction, so our role is to help guide them. So when you think of coaching and how it works, it's pretty simple. It's you know, using Jahari's window. Um, you wanna understand the person's lifestyle. Who are they? Who how do they tick? before you start digging into their disease. I always think of disease like the nesting uh, around your home. You don't like people disturbing it too much because it's pretty private. So you wanna know people before you start digging in there. So in that second part, it's really, do they even have a future vision? Do they even see that they have a future? But then also trying to understand what are the barriers? I was actually at a conference last week in Minnesota. They're using a Minnesota complexity assessment that's out of Belgium that I was very interested in because not only does it look at just things like patient activation measures, but things like literacy, the social setting in which they live, the environment, that gives us one additional filter to look at that individual. But it's also, when we think about activation, it's trying to identify what is the individual's action plan. We love to build out care plans. I've been in nursing for longer than you want to think about 
and I wrote in care plans were 17 pages long. Did they truly help my patient? I don't think so. However, if I can help the individual create their own plan of care that meets their needs, their desires, and their goals, then I'm successful. When Paul was presenting, he reminded me of this slide with regards to decisional balance. And this is really how coaching works. You apply intervention in terms of one side of that beam where people are starting to develop those skill sets. They're starting to gain knowledge and they're starting to build some confidence. We do that through a combination of patient activation engagement, as well as using things like motivational interviewing, helping people reaffirm, understand, reflecting on who and how they want to interact with the healthcare system and helping to build that confidence. And as a result of that activation, people become more self-reliant. They start to see that they have the ability to be a consumer, much like they do in the retail arena. And we also be able to practice prevention much more effectively for themselves and those that they care about. So why all this stuff about patient activation measures? Why all this stuff about engagement? Well, I'm excited. We should all be excited because I think we're on to something when we talk about behavior. Um, we've um, evaluated and surveyed over 35, I think going down 4,000 individuals with regards to patient activation surveys. And what we are able to do now is actually demonstrate, though not definitive, some trends in terms of what we're seeing. And I think they're pretty exciting. When we look at this graph with 704 individuals, uh, we do a pre-survey for everyone uh, at baseline, and then three to six months out, repeat that survey, and oftentimes more so during that time period, to understand where these people are. And what we knew about the 704 individuals is that 220 of them were in one and two levels. These are people easily overwhelmed, really don't understand the system too well, don't see a role, and what we wanted to be able to do is use motivational interv interviewing and health coaching as a means in which to move them forward. And what we saw after that three to six month period is being able to move 108 or 49% of that population into levels three and four. Why is that significant? Well, when I have to report to the people that I report to and they're saying, Rod, you know, you, you put this behavioral based program into place four years ago. You convinced us that this was the right thing to do. This wasn't easy, I'll tell you right now. I had a program that was very didactic. It was very educational. I had a lot of clinicians that said, Rod, we're, we don't know if you're doing the right thing. However, it's been interesting because not only do they see this as a survey tool, they see this as an extension of their practice. It allows them to be more effective in the work that they do. And what we're seeing is that we're being able to provide targeted interventions. So in addition to predictive modeling, looking at profiles in terms of claims utilization, this is just one more big lens, along with the Minnesota um, complexity assessment that allows us to have a better picture of that member. But what we're looking at in terms of um, outcomes, uh, and it's early, but what we're starting to see is decreases in terms of length of stay. We're seeing improvements definitely in terms of medication adherence in this population, um, decreases in ER and urgent care utilization, and also with readmission rates. So that part excites me. We're actually in the, um, we'll have a, a published uh, publication at NCQA Leadership Series that's forthcoming in the next several weeks that talks about what we did over the past four years in terms of embedding patient activation measures and behavioral-based models um, to chronic long-term chronic disease care in, at ODS. And what we wanted to be able to do is not only feature what we do, but really help other people be able to replicate what we've had success doing. Um, I feel very comfortable with people contact me and, have, and do this a lot in trying to help other individuals to try to increase or uh, adapt behavioral-based models to the programs that they're doing. Um, but in, more importantly, it's about these practical examples. It goes beyond just the assessment. It goes beyond just the application of getting this data back. But it's really trying to it really push upon not only your clinical team, but your executive team, the importance of why moving in this direction is so important and why health engagement, using technology, using feedback loops that really provide more real-time information for individuals to change their health is so important. I go back to where I started. How do you align? How do you connect? And how do you truly, truly inspire the people that you work with? That's the importance of what I have to say. Thank you.